politics in the 1920s. Before we begin, I highly encourage you to go to Canvas and download the PowerPoint slides to the 20s. This, present, this video presentation will cover the politics portion at the end of the lecture. Like everything else in the 1920s, politics is a reaction to the progressive movement in the form of conservatism, which comes back in a really big way in the 1920s. Every president in the, elected in the 1920s will be conservative. Left for dead in 1912. We left conservatism for dead in 1912. Now conservatism comes back. In the presidential election of 1920, Warren G. Harding, senator from Ohio, wins the nomination after the convention deadlocked between two candidates, General Leonard Wood, who was a friend of Theodore Roosevelt's, and Illinois Governor Frank Loudon. Harding was heavily supported by the party machinery and Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Many historians consider Harding's nomination to be a deal cut in the back room. Over on the Democrat side, Ohio Governor James Cox won the Democratic nomination over former Secretary of the Treasury William McAdoo, who was a Wilson supporter, and Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, who really did himself no favors by starting the first Red Scare. This is an election that pitted the governor of Ohio versus a senator from Ohio. Harding will win the election with 60% of the vote, thus becoming the first senator of the United States since John Quincy Adams to win the White House. Cox only carried 10 of the former Confederate states. One last thing to mention on this election before, I, before we move on to Harding is that Cox is vice presidential nominee was a very young and youthful Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Harding wins this election in 1920 because he makes a promise to the American people. The promise is a return to normalcy or a departure from the progressive movement. In other words, Harding says with the word normalcy, he is going to lead America back to what they do best, make money and have children. Harding's not going to make the world a better place. In economics, this means an end to trust busting and a return back to good old laissez-faire economics. In foreign policy, this would mean disarmament and isolationism. Now this normalcy reflected Harding's conservative values and his folksy personality. He described himself as just a plain fellow who was old-fashioned, and even reactionary in matters of faith and morals. I prefer to call him a good old boy. Behind the scenes, Harding drank bootleg liquor, even though it's prohibition and liquor is illegal. He smoked and chewed tobacco. He relished his weekly poker games. And he was a womanizer. Each displayed his mistresses in front of everyone, including his wife. In a lot of ways, I think of Warren Harding as a 20th century version of Ulysses S. Grant. Because, like Grant, Harding lacked self-confidence. He was indecisive and unwilling to offend anyone. Harding mixed his cabinet appointments with some of the best minds of the party. For example, he appointed Charles Evans Hughes, Secretary of State, Good choice. Herbert Hoover became Secretary of Commerce and used that post to become a rock star. But then there's other cabinet appointments, just simply cronies and buddies of Harding's. This is a so-called Ohio game. It's the group with which Harding hang out, hung out with, had fun, and played poker over on K Street, not even in the White House. In a lot of ways, this Ohio game was a lot like Andrew Jackson's kitchen cabinet. Weren't official, but they had the president's ear. Now the Ohio gang simply used the White House to line their pockets. 1923, Harding learned that the head of the Veterans Bureau, Charles Forbes, was building a better life for himself by stealing medical supplies from the Veterans Administration. 
Attorney General Harry Daugherty was implicated in the fraudulent handling of German assets seized after World War I. But the biggest scandal of all, and the one that I will ask you about on Module Exam 2, is Teapot Dome in 1923. Teapot Dome was a naval oil reserve in Wyoming. Administration of the reserve fell under the Interior Department and Albert Fall, who used the influence of the Office of Secretary of the Interior to cut sweetheart deals with the oil tycoons. Then they exploited the reserves. In other words, what I'm saying is the oil companies bought oil reserves at cheap and sold to, sold to the public at market. When Fall was exposed, it was discovered that Fall had taken $400,000 in bribes. In comparison, in today's dollars, that's a half million. And remember what I'd said back in, back in Progressive America? Only time you hear about a Secretary of the Interior is a scandal. And the big scandal is Teapot Dome. Now Harding himself avoided these scandals in public disgrace. He's a folksy person, personality. He himself avoided disgrace. He, can, he once confided to a friend, My God, this is a hell of a job. I have no trouble with my enemies. I can take care of my enemies all right. But my damn friends, my goddamn friends, they're the ones that keep me up waking the walking the floor at night. While on a speaking tour of the West, Harding suffered an attack of food poisoning, which then led to a stroke. On August 2nd, 1923, Harding died in San Francisco. Recent information has come to light that is speculated that the person that poisoned, poisoned Harding was none other than his wife. In a, in a moment, so this ends the first part of politics of, in the 20s. Part two will begin with Calvin Coolidge.